Welcome to Name Three Songs. I'm Sarah Fagan. And I'm Jenna Million. And this is a podcast where we challenge sexism in the music industry and empower fangirls. Because let's be honest, fangirls knew about that band way before you did. And if you stick around long enough, we'll also let you in on some new music the girls are already crazy about. So today, we are going back to our regularly scheduled content of challenging sexism in the music industry, since last week we took a little break to talk about Sarah and I's backstories and our journey with this podcast. So we hope you enjoyed that. And prior to that, we did our crossover with Muses, in which we talked about Taylor Swift and Rihanna. And today, we are revisiting those ladies once again. We felt like to celebrate our six months, we should let you guys know a bit more about why you should trust us every Sunday (laughs) when you tune in to name three songs because we do have like a ridiculously long backstories of how we came to this point where we are today hanging out with all of you and so if you decided that you love us even more after learning more about us and seeing both of our chaotic sides for once you should go to patreon.com slash name three songs where we have a lovely community going on there we have a discord we have an option for a bonus episode every month other extra content so jenna do you want to share a bit about this amazing book that we're talking about today it's called your history the 12 strangest women in music by leslie chow who is based in melbourne australia your history is a love letter to pop's most singular achievements celebrating the innovations of women who are still critically underrated it's a ride that includes tributes to chaka khan rihanna nene cherry Sade, shakespeare sisters azalea banks janet jackson kate Bush, Michelle Gervich, TLC, Taylor Swift, and Nicki Minaj. And I just have to say, it was a really fun read. There's so much information packed into so little. It's incredible. But the really cool thing is that basically the premise of this book is she's talking about pop music in a critical way, which it's so often just considered junk food or tossed to the side, not taken seriously. And she like breaks down how the emotion and like the tonality of the voice and the music work together. And it's honestly fascinating. Like I don't think I've ever seen anyone write about music in this way. It was awe-inspiring. And I'm the kind of person that will like get through the like seven pages of detail given and every single sentence in this book is necessary to be read. I literally learned so much and even about some artists that I thought I really understood, but damn, her breakdown of Rihanna and Taylor Swift honestly blew my mind. (laughs) It's just so interesting. So I know a lot of you are big Taylor fans, so definitely get this book because her dissection of the way that Taylor writes her music, especially from like the 19th 89 era on chef's kiss yeah so we're gonna get into that today and leslie chow is an australian writer on music and film she's been writing for more than two decades all around really cool writer really interesting conversation ahead so without further ado today we are joined by leslie chow author of your history so i want to say big thank you leslie for joining us how are you doing today I'm doing well. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, of course. We're super excited for the discussion today. So Sarah, would you like to give an overview of what we're getting into today? Today, we are talking about pop music once again, and these women in pop who are doing things differently, but are still not taken seriously because the world of media and music critics never knows exactly how to handle pop music. And you so perfectly in your book, it sort of explained why it is that these artists aren't taken seriously. So can you just share like a brief overview of why you personally think that these pop artists have not been taken that seriously throughout their careers? Well, most of the women in my book have kind of emotional effects that could be described as, you know, crass, artificial, obscene, extreme sexuality, stuff like that, that may not be that well received by the critical establishment. And also, I just think pop in general, if you measure it by the standards of writerly lyrics or cohesion, pop's not really going to hold up in that way compared compared to say guitar rock or folk. Some music critics may be going more for cohesion or a focused vision in an album. What pop does best is contradictions and mixed messages. Yeah, and I think the all of the artists we're going to talk about today, they are that perfect contradiction of things that are honestly quite unexpected. And I love this idea that pop music is considered junk food and that and also the fact that, as you mentioned, lyrically, if the lyrics aren't intelligent or like, 
like leading into more mystery or like storytelling it's just like blown off as like not good music and it's honestly i think sarah will agree it's such like a refreshing take to hear pop music talked about critically since it so often isn't also the thing that's so interesting and so helpful is just most of these fans of these artists will sit there and read these reviews or the commentary on these artists and be like what did this person not pay any attention to their back catalog like did they do no research did they read no interviews because artists we're going to be talking about like Kate Bush and Taylor Swift and even like Nicki Minaj there's so much backstory to the music that they're writing and the lyrics that they're writing and yet because it is in this guilty pleasure category of music it just gets written off straight away and I think that throughout the chapters of your book you very clearly are like have you even like read these lyrics <laughs> like do you know what's going on here and also the fact that you know what makes an articulate sentence in a book isn't the same as what makes a great lyric a lyric can be d- d- depending on how the singer enunciates it can be deadened it can be given kind of full blast the meanings behind the words change depending Mm. on how they're put across by the singer so when I list a couple of critics who sort of fault pop singers for you know incorrect grammar or you know like um imperfect knowledge or bad sentence structure and it's, it's, it's a strange set of standards to apply to something as fluid and mobile and mysterious as pop music I think oh definitely for sure because there is so much more meaning and I feel like just in any music the way that it's sung the way that they perform it the music that goes with the lyrics like there's so much that has to add up to equal to a song that for these people to just ignore something because they're like oh every part of this wasn't created by the artist which sometimes it even is especially like in Taylor Swift's situation like she basically creates everything just to be so critical of it is interesting in and of itself. I mean, the bass line and the rhythm can work against the apparent meaning of the lyric because it would be on the page. There are so many things to take into consideration when you're considering what pop music means. And I also like appreciated that you pulled artists from over the decades because it was really cool to see that evolution. And I think that's kind of a good segue into talking about two main historical examples, which would be Janet Jackson and Kate Bush, which both really jumped out to Sarah and I. Because I mean, because... The idea of pop has changed so much through the decades from when Elvis was called a pop star to when Madonna was called a pop star and everything in between and since. And when we were doing some like extra research on these things, I was blown away that Kate Bush and Madonna are literally the same age, maybe like a month or two off from each other. And yet I would have never even put them in the same center. <laughs> like They just exist in essentially alternate realities in my mind just because yeah. they're so different yet Kate Bush is talked about as like a pop singer and Madonna's talked about as a pop singer but of course Madonna's like a pop star pop icon what have you but when it came to you writing about Kate Bush I was just so enthralled with how you were referring to like her creativity as like magpie creativity it's like they're attracted to like bright shiny objects but I feel like that so perfectly describes Kate Bush's music and her style of doing things it's just everything is like bright shiny new and interesting and you're just like drawn to it and she's drawn to it (laughs) like I don't know I feel like she's always like lost in what she's doing and I guess that's why personally as somebody so far removed from her music I just never would have been like oh yes pop music when Kate Bush was big was she referred to as a pop singer or was the whimsical weirdness something that was acknowledged at that time of all the artists in the book I mean Kate Bush is definitely the most respected the most unquestioned as a musical genius So for that reason, I wanted to draw attention to the pop aspect of her, which I felt was underrated. The immediacy of her music, the way it kind of catches and releases your instincts, the way that in a funny way, she has something in common with Diane Warren in in the catchiness of her songs. Pop is the vehicle through which which her sensibility became ubiquitous. So the melodic drive behind the songs is very much that of pop. And so Sarah and I were kind of discussing this a little bit earlier and like, so Kate Bush debuted at the very end, I think it was like 1978 yeah and then janet jackson madonna these artists uh, debuted more like 82 and we were kind of discussing how it was like that four-year gap but it somehow like made all the difference and it felt like she had more control over being almost like an avant-garde version of pop but that's that's also my perspective of I didn't know her growing up. Like, this is kind of me discovering her now. So for me, the fascinating thing about Kate Bush is the way that she 
complexes, the avant-garde, the obtuse, the obscure with the most immediate aspects of pop, the, the rhythms that have an instant effect on your body. Sometimes in Running Up That Hill and a few other songs, it even reminds me of kind of Japanese pop themes. It's so, it's, it's so catchy and it's so condensed. Those two aspects working together are what makes her music really interesting to me. The other thing that was so interesting is that Janet Jackson's solo career did start so soon after Kate Bush's did and Janet Jackson was like 16, I think. It was so crazy because when we were first talking, like Janet and I because I remember vividly like Janet Jackson's like Super Bowl performance. I remember her music videos being on like VH1 and MTV. And I just, I always thought she was like the same age as Britney, <laughs> as Britney just because of like her energy. The Justin connection. I don't the know. Justin connection. But yeah, in doing research for this, I was like, oh crap. Like I know who Janet Jackson is, but it was that thing where I was like, oh, like, wow, she was older than I realized. And also at the same time, her career has taken so many different steps to the point of when I knew her. And so in reading like what you were writing and sort of the ways that her music has changed and all that sort of stuff, at what point, or do you think at all points in her career was the, was she leaning towards pop music? Or do you think that there was at some point it more so felt like what people view as, as pop? Was she taken more seriously at one point in her career than another? Or like, what are your viewpoints on that? Well, Janet and her amazing producers, Jam and Lewis, changed what pop could be. They changed it from something that could seem confected to something that was you know hard angular aggressive abrasive and I don't think that the innovation of that was fully recognized at the time it was more thought of well you know Janet can punch her weight too alongside her brother Michael and I think it's only in the last few years that her debut album with Jam and Lewis Control has really been recognized as one of one of the great albums and it's also interesting to look at her image back at the time of uh, Rhythm Nation and Janet the fact that she was fully covered kind of seeming almost kind of clandestine and wary I'm not sure that I'm not sure that that could happen today without a lot of intense scrutiny or questioning of her image I loved that part when you said that she always dressed in like an unrevealing black suit but it felt very erotic at the time it was almost like the the question of like the what's underneath like you don't know and that's yeah. something that today we see with Billie Eilish she's always wearing like bigger baggier t-shirts or track suits and she's like been in the spotlight as a teenager same as janet jackson really like they both came onto the scene when they were like 15 16 and now billy eilish is like 18 but it's that same thing and the media now has talked a lot about her body of like oh is she skinny is she thick and then like when they finally like got a photo of her in like a tank top it was like all over the news do you think janet jackson's like her appearance was talked about in the same way I think the 80s and the early 90s were a fair period for women in terms of image, um, a lot less constricting visually. There wasn't that discomfort with being covered and if they're covered, why they're being covered, why can't I see what they look like and what are they hiding? That's really interesting because it's like you would think like now we're more progressive or like our ideas have moved forward, but it's yeah, you're shaking your head no, like the exact opposite. I mean, if you look at TLC, the way that they dressed with baggy pants, left eye would often use, a, you know, like a condom as a monocle and have safe sex imagery everywhere. If you imagine the way that would be scrutinized today, it would take up, it would be the substance of almost every interview or every article about them. The fact that we went from the era of media slowly becoming more accessible to people and women being allowed to be like freer and do stuff and then towards the late 90s early 2000s gossip brags getting so big and then like attacking these women and then people sort of starting to realize like that's not okay but then like political correctness became a bigger thing and yeah at the same time we're like oh like women show themselves because they're liberated and they're allowed to so if they don't we're gonna give them crap about it but if they do we're gonna give them more crap about it <laughs> and it like creates that sort of pop star like pop singer issue and you mentioned this in the book of being virginal and horny at the same time <laughs> just like at one point they were sort of allowed to do that with no question whereas I feel like now there's so many questions because you're doing that. I mean, even if you think about fashion in the 80s with pop stars and in general, there were sort of big ballooning shapes. You didn't really need to know what someone's body was like underneath it with the shoulder pads. And now it's like, I, th I think people get worried if they can't see what a woman's body is like. Why is she wearing a shapeless boxy suit? I mean, if she's going to wear a suit, 
police it needs to be less smoking so that we can see the definition of, of her body and as far as I know like um, Billie Eilish is the only major English language pop star who doesn't dress in a particularly body con way and there are all these questions about it so I don't think it's sometimes they create a the magazines create a false dichotomy as to well you can, you can be sexy and you can be taken seriously but I think if you don't appear sexy can you be taken seriously is there even a choice I mean that is quite the question <laughs> are you even a player right yeah yeah I mean Billie Eilish is the only one but she is so different and so unique that like even though yes they talk about her body she's the only Billie Eilish like nobody even stands close to her so it's like she really is holding her own in the music sphere so mm -hmm. she was going to succeed no matter what why aren't people talking more about her music you know yeah instead of her image or her influence influence on body shapes and presentation in pop culture. Yeah. I think we run into that issue a lot though and it felt like we were running into that issue through like in your book where you're talking about these women who it takes them to get to a certain point in their career for people to finally like revisit music and be like oh why were we sleeping on this why were we not paying attention to it and I think I mean just to take us out of like the women thing for a second like also right now it's like people especially men are on the internet are like rediscovering One Direction and they're like oh this this was good and it's like of course it was good when were girls ever wrong never <laughs> So I, ju I just think it's cr it's so crazy to me that like literally in black and white in your book is like, yeah, these women were writing really creative lyrics. They were singing really creatively. And somebody like Janet Jackson, who's been making music since the 80s, like, essentially wasn't taken really seriously until the 21st century and like a good way into it, at least a good way into the beginning of it. <laughs> but like, it's just insane. So one more question while we're talking about these women of the past we were discussing women like britney janet jackson Cher. like what are your thoughts on women who continue their pop careers outside of basically their teen or their early 20 year ages well again i, I kind of look back to the 80s and 70s when pop wasn't such a young person's game mm. you would have Kind of Tina Turner singing about, um, you know, what's love got to do with it and private dancers singing about what it's like to be jaded and feeling like you're past it and having had this long history of affairs. Today, when someone s sounds jaded or weary in a song, it's more likely teenager like Billie Eilish or um, someone like Lana Del Rey, where being jaded is sort of part of the persona, part of the art direction. But age is really kind of a taboo subject in pop right now, the way that overt sexuality might once have been. Yeah, I think that's interesting because if we're thinking about famous pop stars, a lot of them are like famous pop stars from like the 80s. And Sarah and I have talked about how we think there's like this gap in the 90s where like grunge and hip hop were both really popular and there wasn't like a lot of proper pop stars. So that could be part of it also. But like nobody, well, at least I don't think anyone is like, oh my God, Beyonce's 40 because Beyonce is still at the peak of her career. Whereas like the, uh, the then the next person up is like Cher and you're just like, oh, Cher is old because she's like so much older. Cher is still kind of celebrated for, you know, her, her, her glamour and her iconography. I think that some of these pop stars will be looking very carefully at the merciless treatment of Madonna by the press and social media, media really just constantly telling her to cover up, grow up, stop showing you, your, your body. Nobody wants to see it. And how they can avoid the same fate and maybe does it does it mean having to look as spectacular as Jennifer Lopez all the time I mean that's one way of eluding eluding criticism right and Cher maybe is kind of so generous an icon maybe that's the way that pop stars need to go I think Beyonce has me made a real effort to shift her image from pop star to living myth and it's been very successful and the music has been great has been definitely been wonderful so she probably can make that transition the way Cher did and Diana Ross did yeah based on what you were saying it's almost like once they hit a certain age or like a certain part of their career they become like this timeless figure like they're untouchable and like you don't know how old they are unless they're Madonna yeah, so like Madonna, her whole life, the media's like, show your body. And then you get to a certain age and they're like, don't show your body. Wait, put, you know, put it, put it away. Like, I don't understand why the media has been so relentlessly cruel with her in particular. And maybe it's the case for female pop stars and celebrities, actors in general. 
I think that Madonna is like an outlier because like Kylie Minogue is the same thing. She's still such a huge like icon legend of a person, especially like in England. And she's in the bodysuits. She's dancing around dressed like a pop star still. And I feel like she's still lauded as like a legend, whereas Madonna's doing the same thing. They're around the same age. And it's yeah, I think because Madonna was always this like controversial figure, the media is still just like, you're going to be controversial. And we're like, but she's larger than life. Why? Like you aren't doing this to Kylie. You're not doing this to Cher. You're not doing this to like Gwen Stefani who's still younger but still and we're like okay why is Madonna like the punching bag in this situation just interesting because I feel like a lot of the women in your book have been given the ability to have sort of a quote-unquote redemption arc by these like men in media who've decided that they're the end-all to be-all whereas somebody like Madonna is weirdly one of the few that they've refused to allow to have that. I hope you're right that Madonna is an anomaly, but by and large, I almost feel that this is the way that most women in the public eye would be treated if they didn't look like Jennifer Lopez or Kylie Minogue, who frankly look better now than they did in their 20s. People who don't have the means or the option to do that will be as relentlessly attacked as Madonna has been, I think. Which is rude because women all get hotter as they get older and men all start to look the same. Well, I agree. Maybe I'm biased, but yes, I agree. (laughs) I mean, like, I think it goes without saying, but I'm just going to say it anyways, as men do not get the same criticism as they age. No. Right. So, I mean, so you often see actresses and pop stars suddenly, you know, at 40, deciding that they want to ease out of the game while they're still successful. Why is that? You, you don't want to come under that scrutiny. You don't want to be a joke. You want to leave while you're still on top. Yeah. Oh, leave while you're still on top. That's a good point, too. Because, I mean, I think Kate Bush hasn't put out music in a while like she's kind of left her career alone janet jackson's done some stuff kate bush and sade probably you know aren't aren't nearly as prolific as the other artists yeah so i'm like in 10 years is taylor swift still gonna be putting out records in 20 years that's a question and because she is such a lightning rod for conversation in the way that madonna was how will she be treated as she ages yeah so i actually think that's a perfect segue into our main discussion of more recent artists and taylor swift being the first example so Why did you choose her in particular to include on your list of the 12 strangest women in music? Right. Well, the first time I was really interested in Taylor Swift was the video for Blank Space, which I thought had that riveting combination of sour and sweet. It was someone who kind of wanted to expose all the tricks behind their persona, at least in terms of the narrator of the song. It wasn't someone who wanted to um, keep up the facade of being, as you say, horny and virginal or innocently arousing. It was someone who wanted to say, I designed all this. And if you're reacting it, it's because I meant you to react to it. I've programmed your reaction in a way. So for me, there's something exciting about someone who's willing to, at least in terms of the characters they play in songs, to to draw attention to the facade and the artificiality behind, you know, the girlishness that they project. I feel like Taylor was, because she's also been in the spotlight since she was very young, and I feel like she never played that role of, like, the virgin whore line. I feel like her music was always very serious. It was projected onto her, though, wasn't it? Yeah, but so she never like stepped into that role whereas like people like Britney Spears kind of did step into that role with Taylor's music she was always like a lovesick puppy and sort of pining after boys or singing about how a boy broke her heart and it always felt like she was trying to give off this idea of her being like the romance novel heroine sort of thing but also damsel in distress at the same time and yet the media the whole time was like we want you to be sexier and you're singing about your ex-boyfriend so like we know you're fucking people so where's that information information and so it yep. is that where are thing. the receipts <laughs> she's like i'll give it to you i'll give you the extremes yeah. of what what it's like to perform being sexy what it's like to perform being innocent all these kind of you know masks that were forced onto her yeah i think when 1989 came out that's with blank space like that, that sort of is what happened i feel like that's when we started to see like the facade that her family and her label had sort of been like you need to fit into this perfect pink bow sort of box of a girl and then she was like i'm sick of this if they want me to be crazy and they want me to be like sexy and insane like i'm gonna give them every facet of this personality that they've created for me in different ways and it started with that record by her Mm -hmm. sort of being like I know what you want but do you know who I am 
Yeah, absolutely. That sort of that 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 play with persona that she has by someone at the top of her game is really quite provocative. I think she doesn't have to do it. I mean, look at all look at so many other pop stars, Ariana Grande, who are sort of content to sort of retreat behind the facade and don't want to show the workings behind it. And Taylor really wants to kind of, I feel, show you how generic these archetypes are. Yeah, I mean, I just thought it was so interesting how you acknowledged in the like section about Taylor how she was sort of saying about like with her red lipstick and like these different ways of like explaining herself in the song, which I've always known was happening, but wasn't a really aware of it until reading. He constantly sings about clothes and makeup. Mm-hmm. And some might say, well, well that's just because, you know, that's, that's just what a girl would be interested in. But actually for her to sing about the components in, that go into making this kind of classic image that she has is quite unusual. It feels very much like her acknowledging, like, maybe this isn't actually who I am. And I feel like it's never been clear to me that Taylor has been trying to break away from this idea of Taylor Swift for such a long time. And it wasn't until recently that she finally put her foot down and was like, I'm sick and tired of pretending I don't care about things. I also feel like unless you've been following her career trajectory, you still wouldn't know that she's doing that. Like you still would assume she's just this blonde Barbie. And I think also when you take a critical look at her music, she is very cunning and very calculated, but it's almost still feels like a mask of like, we don't actually know who the real Taylor Swift is. I think with these two most recent albums, she's finally like, hey, I'm actually a cozy cottage bitch. (laughs) Right. But then, you know, We'll see what happens. I mean, she might go and do a pop reinvention. I hope she does because I love the way that she plays with masks and wants to tell you very much that they are masks instead of, you know, remaining kind of safely demure or, you know, this is just how I am. I mean, really every album cycle of Taylor's is like a new vision of her, especially since 1989. And then Reputation was like her just being angry and being like, guys, I tried, like, why, why did you miss what everything I was trying to tell you was 1989? And then she made like this angry album. And then after that is when Lover came out and it just was like the sickly. It was the reaction to the press cycle of the, the press of the previous cycle. Yeah, and it's just, it's so interesting how she, like, handles these things. And the thing that was so frustrating is when Reputation came out, I was working at this Gossip News website, and it just felt like everybody just missed the message, and instead they were, like, doing, I feel like they did the, the media did the exact opposite of what Taylor wanted them to do, because they were like, oh, look, like, she's showing us how, like, she's, like, snake-like, and, like, all this stuff, I'm like, no, she's telling you that you're snake-like, it's the other way around, but the media media doesn't want to be self-reflective whereas Taylor's like I want you to be self-reflective and then they like didn't get it and she was like okay and then I mean obviously this is just my personal opinion not as like a Taylor stan just as a music enthusiast and then the next album's Lover which is like sickly sweet pop music where I think so many people were like confused especially ones like not in her fan base I think her fan base more so got it but I mean me personally I was like you went from sampling Right Said Fred to like sampling maybe from My Little Pony and I'm so confused. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a whole different set of imagery. I mean, except for the last two albums, which kind of uh, are more homogenous, like it's a whole different set of imagery um, that she brings to each album. But um, since 1999, I feel that the cunning and knowingness uh, are something that she has been unusually unafraid to display for a female artist. We could dissect Taylor Swift for a very long time and we're probably going to dedicate another episode to that. So I feel like this is a good point to move on to our next person of the hour, Rihanna, who is the wealthiest woman in music. And so she has dozens of hits since the beginning of her career. Like her career started off with hits and then she did her fashion line, her beauty line all around. She's like an empire, yet she's criticized a lot. So in what ways does she fit into this category? In, in terms of her strangeness, I, I was probably thinking of the effectlessness of her voice. We all know that she can be a soul singer or a blues singer if she wants to be on certain songs. But for the most part, I mean, her, her voice is kind of, it's, it's like Teflon. It's like silicone. She, she gives the illusion of sort of phoning it in with her vocal. And I think critics have been really uncomfortable with the fact, with, with, with the fact of that seeming effortlessness, which is quite unusual in a female pop star where Usually it's like you, you, you have to show that you're giving it up. You have to show that how many octaves your, your range is. Yeah. And the fact that she was kind of 
affectless and kind of, you know, sort of a little bit punk in her delivery, I think yeah. kind of discomforted people. You point out the song Umbrella, which you hear that, that she sings like the Ella, Ella, AA, which... <laughs> iconic song for all of us. I feel like that song forever lives in my head. And then we see the same thing in her like 2016 album, Auntie, or we see it throughout her career, but especially on the song work, like I went, as I was reading the book, I went back and listened to that. And I was like, wow, she really did. Like, it's so, it's so interesting, like the way she sings it. And it's the exact like similar delivery as Umbrella that we've seen throughout her career. And she's been famous nonetheless, and yet she's still criticized for it, even though like she's gonna be rich and famous, whether or not people criticize her. Well, I feel like she's been criticized on those grounds that people often criticize pop, that it's too, it's sloppy. I mean, they even use, I mean, that's a term they use for her voice. Um, it's haphazard, it's sloppy. It doesn't seem to have a coherent meaning. And they seem upset that she doesn't, you know, pronounce every consonant or extrude her vowels. I mean, they seem to take that as, you know, as evidence of lack of a work ethic, which is kind of ridiculous. A song like work would not sound good if somebody was like, work, 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 work. work. I was, was going to say, why don't you work, work, work? Work, work. yeah right and, and like that and, would yeah, not be a banger in the club <laughs> exactly and, and and yet there were all these um, I, I mean you know there's lots of women singing about work I mean there's Missy Elliott work it and Britney's work bitch but um I, I I just think it's very odd the way that speaking in her particular vernacular was seen as you know in review after review evidence of being kind of slovenly or not caring I just like think that everything like I just, I think that everything Rihanna does is for her is she's doing it because she, like I feel like there's a reason behind it I don't think that Rihanna does anything with no reason and it's proven in like the empire she's created and the fan base that she's grown from her music and her other work and I think also in a way the fact that she is singing where it kind of feels like she could do it like harder like she could put more effort in it's just like her being like I'm sexy in everything I do why does it matter but also again I don't know if people like I've never lived in Barbados like I don't know what the style of singing is there I don't know what's popular there it's like these critics could just be informed on like Western Americanized music. And it's like what Rihanna's doing could literally just be like what's popular, what she's grown up with in Barbados. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> it's like, okay, so what if she's not enunciating? I know Bob Marley's not from Barbados, but like, could you ever understand a word Bob Marley was singing? No, but he was lauded for it because he was a man. But it's like these things where they're from like these caribbean countries that have their their own culture they have their own thing that these white people don't understand and then they're judged for it or she's judged for it i also think that um if women sound effectless in a pop context as opposed to an avant-garde context because we all know you know kim gordon lady tron they can all have sort of um nonchalant female voices but it, it seems as being within the realm of art but in pop it, it's it, it's seen as a lack of caring a lack of a lack of effort yeah and the way you because you caught out like a few critics or like pulled out some quotes from them the way they were describing it was like going back to that idea that like women must be entertaining or like must must entertain us they're like she's not interesting enough she's not trying hard enough it's like trying hard enough for who for you to be entertained like I'm like getting to look at Rihanna for more than five seconds is an- entertaining enough. Like, what else? <laughs> what else do they want from her? I'm, I mean, the way with some of those songs, you know, Diamonds, Rude Boy. I mean, those songs are interesting precisely because of her kind of lack of effect. I don't know if you want to hear someone sing their heart out on Diamonds on American Idol and kind of giving it up for the high notes. It's more interesting the way it is when it's slightly impersonal, slightly distant. It, it, it's kind of the way Diamonds are, sort of crystalline, perfect. And I mean, I've never listened to a song that Rihanna's featured on and been like, this would be better without Rihanna on it. So... <laughs> And so it just blows my mind that there is this need in the media to just criticize every possible thing they can about women 
in every aspect especially for something like pop that these same critics are like there's nothing special about it like it's just like a guilty pleasure music it's not real and yet rihanna is essentially to them not taking it seriously and they're like how dare you not take pop seriously and it's like what what side of the fence are you on and with the songs um you know we found love in a hopeless place and this is what you came from particularly we found love in a hopeless place they said well she's just repeating the same line over and over again why is there no originality or uh, variation and what makes those songs is their kind of hypnotic effect uh, the way that those words and those messages sort of drill into you along with the beat until you can hardly make sense of what they mean so I mean it's, it's, it's not as if she couldn't be singing you know a different line or a more conventionally articulate line if she wanted to but I feel like it's like if you're having Rihanna on a song as like guest vocals you're having her on because of the tone of voice that she has because of the style in which she sings so it's essentially like stop critiquing Rihanna when they're utilizing Rihanna Rihanna's way of singing as essentially another instrument and I would I would think that in some ways critics would be able to acknowledge that they're utilizing her voice in a way to add layers to the song rather than anything else particular instrument it's metallic it has a certain register I don't know why you kind of expect her to do melisma or for her voice to do more than it does I think also like Rihanna is a perfect example for this but you come back to this theme throughout the book of like it wouldn't be the same if it was somebody else it wouldn't be the same if it wasn't this way and these songs are famous for a reason yes and like it that that part of it is so easily overlooked Exactly. Like I, I think, I think with pop, the interpretation is that well, it could have been anyone. Sometimes it could have been anyone, and the song would still have broken through. But I mean, there are so many cases. I mean, TLC were offered "Baby One More Time," which went to Britney Spears. It would have had a completely different meaning, a different and defiant meaning coming from um, TLC. "Milkshake" by Khalees was pitched to Britney first, and they turned it down. Right. I mean, and apparently, many of the songs on Justin Timberlake "Justified" were pitched to Michael Jackson. He didn't want them. Ooh, but, Justin Timberlake just got the, the leftovers. I feel like that's what Justin deserves. I mean, even Rihanna's first song, SOS, was offered to Christina Million. And I'm not sure that it would have been a hit coming from Million. Um, it, it, it's strange because the, the, the song SOS is about supplicating. I need help. You're damaging me. But yet her voice is unrelenting. And it's kind of the contradiction that makes the song addictive. So obviously, Rihanna's not lazy, but in many different ways like these men have been like she's lazy what she's doing is like not focused all that sort of thing and then when you specifically acknowledge that when auntie came out that they were sort of like oh this feels like cheaply affected like cheap and all that sort of thing and like lazy and, 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 and so cheaply effective is something that's often applied to pop a rock guitar or, you know a rock riff no matter how catchy isn't considered cheaply effective and i, I don't I don't know why that is. Yeah, and it's 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 just so weird. But also, it just felt like they were being even more aggressively critical of these sort of choices that she made on this album because she had like stepped away from music to focus on like her business side of things. And mm -hmm. so, do you think that in a way they were being more judgmental because they were like, oh, because they weren't expecting her to come back to music, and when she did, it wasn't like this glitzy, glamorous thing. It was just Rihanna. Well, I mean, Sade only makes one album in a decade and isn't really criticised for it. So, I mean, Shakespeare's sister only, uh, you know, you know, only have only have a handful of albums. I think that because because people were more aware, maybe, of Rihanna's extracurricular activities, that 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 made them see her as more of a dilettante. But I mean, let's face it, what 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 she's done with fashion and music has had an amazing impact on the culture. Her lingerie line seems to have pulled off. Victoria's Secret, for God's sakes. That's powerful of having, some, for some reason, it shouldn't have been the case, but for some reason, including every skin tone in your foundation spectrum was considered revolutionary. And everyone's been scrambling to follow suit. So maybe because of these other ventures that she's had, people felt she wasn't concentrating on music. But I think, is, is there a need to be so prolific? I don't think five years, eight years between albums is such a bad thing. I mean, because Auntie, Auntie was worth it. Auntie was worth the wait. And, um, you know, we'll see with the next album. Janet, Janet Jackson also takes quite a, quite a while between, it, between albums. I don't yeah. think there's an without content all the time. 
No, I agree. I think that we're just like living in this era of like everything's so accessible and people are just creating stuff all the time. And I think that that's like also why the next person, Nicki Minaj, who we're going to be talking about is so interesting in music is that while there's never a year where we don't hear from Nicki Minaj in music because she is so prolific in like the guest section of music. I actually feel she does her best work in guest segments and so that really benefits her in fact when she has you know three or four male collaborators she dazzles I mean she easily outshines them I think having collaborators is something that really works to showcase her even more than her solo work. So do you think because she is such like a prolific like featured artist on songs is that a big reason as to why you included her on like a list of like strange women in pop or was there more to it? Well, yes, I mean, it's because she's kind of changed the idea. I mean, what colour is Nicki Minaj? What form or what sex is Nicki Minaj? I mean, she's kind of changed the idea. She's she's kind of um, inverted a lot of um, preconceptions about what a woman, a black woman should be doing. This Cockney accent that she uses that um, that her fans love, but um, which used to get, you know, a, a lot of mockery from people. Why is she speaking in a Cockney accent? Why is she... Why, why, why does she adopt all these different voices? I think that's how Nikki expresses herself. She, she, she would find it too constricting to speak in a single, legible, coherent voice, which is what people tend to want from their songwriters uh, classically. And she just bursts through that. She's, she, she, she's many, you know, as they say, you know, in Soylent Green, like Nicki Minaj is people, right? Like she seems to span every spectrum in terms of color and language and sexuality and gender. Yeah, she's definitely a shapeshifter for sure. And I think that's like, obviously that's what sets her apart, but because that's so different from like the norm, quote unquote, that also makes her like a target for criticism. Well, I think perhaps they they feel like she's taking on these quirks as kind of gimmicks and they find, they find them annoying. But I do think that Nicki Minaj has, you know, the, the really creative inability to be one person at one time, even just for one sentence, if you listen to her um, singing on Monster or even just, you know, guesting on Saturday Night Live. She's a chameleon of sorts. Like the, I feel like a lot of people's first thought of Nicki Minaj is like hip hop, like rap artists. But when you really think about it, like she's featured on like songs with artists from like Lil Wayne to Drake to Katy Perry. She's literally, there's there's very few artists that are in like that A-list spectrum of musician that Nicki Minaj hasn't done a song with. And it's just so crazy that because she is able to sort of be a chameleon with things that she's criticized for it when somebody like David Bowie made his whole career off of the fact that he would literally just like change who he was from album to album. And it's like she has the ability to do that from song to song and you're going to criticize it. You should be celebrating it. Right. Um, she, she's not seen as the kind of master of all her personas in the way that Bowie was. I was just curious because like we think of Nicki Minaj as this like rap queen and some of the women in this book lean more on like the hip hop rap side of things. So I was curious in what ways do they fit into the world of pop or do you mean pop more in the sense of like popular? I mean more in the sense of popular music and I mean in the sense of immediacy. Um, I feel like every artist in this book does something immediately to your hips as well as, as your brain. You You kind of experience it in your body before but before you even digest is this a good lyric before you know that it's an irresistible lyric it's a compulsive it's, lyric. yeah it's so subconscious and that's the reason why it's funny that like that these artists sometimes get, are criticized for not having good lyrics it's because like or repetitive lyrics you know uh, you know as if they just couldn't well as, as if they couldn't come up with alternative verses but the impact would not be the same and I mean, Nicki Minaj is somebody who's, as you mentioned, Azalea Banks also, they're so unique in the way they write and like the phrasing they use, but so much is portrayed in their emotion and their delivery of it that it's almost like the lyrics could be whatever, what like anything, but they bring so much to the performance that like that is more than half of it. Yeah, um, Azalea Banks probably has more verbal invention than any poet or writer I can think of right now. She's um, she's so idiosyncratic. I mean, she might be a special case in that, you know, because of social media or whatever, um, her reputation has gone down. But if you just look and if you just listen to the music, what she's coming up with, her imagery is, is extraordinary. I'm surprised that we don't 
hear more about the fact that she constantly talks about food and devouring and um, ha has these really specific um, preoccupations um, in her lyrics. Yeah, I, I also thought it was cool that you you pinpointed for a lot of these people like the subject matter that they tend to revolve around, which was really cool. It's almost like for Azalea, food is what, you know, red lips and dresses are to Taylor Swift or um, being a, a goth vixen is to Shakespeare's sister. They all have preoccupations that keep popping up again and again and it seems to be less an exercise in branding than you know that, that they have these obsessions that work themselves through in different songs I mean, these critics get nothing from their lyrics <laughs> since we've been talking about pop over the decades you know we mentioned billy eilish earlier who's one of the like newcomers within the pop world what are your hopes or maybe your thoughts on the way pop music can be spoken about in the media like moving forward well, when I'm writing this book, people are like, seriously, you're writing about Rihanna? You're writing about Nicki Minaj? Taylor Swift? Why don't you write about Laurie Anderson or Nina Hagen? And when I tell them I'm writing about Kate Bush, then it's like, oh, well, that's okay then. But I'm hoping that um, sort of the moments of strangeness and contradiction that, that, that pop is especially good at will come to be valued um, just as much as the, you know, the more coherent meanings that we get in other genres. You know, the way that the singer says, ooh, or um, the way that they choose to um, kind of hold back or inflect a lyric will be given the same amount of attention as, say, a really quotable line from, you know, Nick Cave. I did really like how you explained that, like, the different ways that ooze are utilized in song can mean so many different things. And I have this band that I really like called McFly, who sing a lot of, like, ooze and la-las and, like, na-nas and, like, those sort of things. Really? I'll have to check them out. I don't know them. They love, like, those filler, like, words and sounds. And my mom, like, my, my parents really liked them too, but she would always joke and be like, oh, like, is this the, like, na-na-na song or, like, the na-na song? <laughs> and I'd be like, oh, we, we know exactly, I know exactly what you're talking about. And so it's just funny that it's something that a band that I grew up on utilized so much and I knew exactly what they meant by them. And you know which one they mean by each different one, which is kind yeah. of, right? <laughs> like, I mean, I haven't listened to McFly, but with, you know, these other songs I'm talking about, it's not a throwaway ooh you. It's kind of like, you know, something odd is happening, you know, some odd injection of energy is happening with the ooh, or in the case of, you know, ooey, 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 like the sop, sop, something is being sort of, you know, expanded and narrowed. Um, this that there, there is something strange, which is is transmitted to the listener in that yeah. moment and specific and I feel like that could be something that people look more at yeah and I, I feel like these younger artists like Billy are like utilizing sound in such a new and different way and so they're utilizing like melodic noises in a different way so I feel like in your next book you'll have like a new sound to dice that <laughs> I, yeah, I hope so. I mean, I'm I'm thinking I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking in two directions of another book of music, more weird women, or weird women film. So again, to use Billie Eilish as an example, just because she's so unique. Do you think young artists like Billie, who are kind of like really pushing the boundaries on pop, are they also kind of allowing music journalists to maybe reevaluate pop music under a more critical scope? I hope so. I mean, I think there is increasing respect for pop. When you look at top 10s, top 50s songs that you should listen to now, there, there is more representation for pop, hip hop, soul and funk. But I think it's still... I think it's I, I think what we think of as a great stock song is still quite limited. And even though everyone thinks Nana Cherry is great, Nana Cherry is an innovator, you never hear her name listed in, you know, amongst the greatest songwriters or the or greatest songs. I think also though, like how positively Dua Lipa's been like accepted by the greater journalism world and like people just like celebrating Dua when she sings cut and dry pop music. Mm -hmm. I think that that is sort of showing that there is that willingness to like be a bit more accepting because I feel like I haven't ever seen anybody like making fun of her or like criticizing I don't, yeah, her. I don't know that if I've seen anyone criticizing her. Yeah, so I just, I don't know if it's because everybody's so, like, enamored by, like, everything about her or, like, what it is, but I... I she has a super, she has a super, super streamlined sound and image, which I think tends to make her kind of above reproach in many ways. Her sound isn't as interesting to me as someone who, who, who can switch between different tones, but for sure she's, you know, right now she's 
the closest that you can think of to a pop machine. Yeah, exactly. And I wonder if that's also why it's hard, like there is no criticism, is because there's nothing really to criticize. It's all super, super tasteful. Mm -hmm. Um, There aren't kind of odd changes of tone or jolts or kind of, um, there's not really much slang in her language, I think. There's nothing very strange about it. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So I think one final question for me, at least, uh, since you mentioned kind of like these top 10 lists and like songs over the decades, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on like, what makes the song that stands the test of time? Something that is truly memorable and which couldn't have been expressed in any other way than through music and perhaps with this particular singer. You, you can't read the lyrics on a page and say that that's a great writer. It needed the, the vehicle of, of, of this particular voice, you know, this particular rhythmic flow, kind of the push and pull. That's what makes the song indelible. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you, Leslie. Your book, Your History, The 12 Strangest Women in Music is out now for people to go grab a copy. And are there any other websites or social links you want to plug for people to follow up and find you or anything? Oh, so I'm just, I'm newly on Twitter as of maybe like, like less than two months ago. So at Leslie Chow story, just finding my feet there. And you can get the book from Repeater Books, um, independent bookshops, Amazon. We'll have all of your links and everything in our in our description. So if anyone wants to go get yourself a copy, that'll be linked. I just want to say thank you again, Leslie. We're definitely gonna be looking forward to more of your work. Thank you. Somehow we finish an episode and my brain is filled with more knowledge than it had when we started. And I don't know how we do it. Yeah, it's always fun when that happens. Leslie is like a great, very, very knowledgeable, very critical thinker, which is fun. Yeah, and great for what we're doing because the more of a critical thinker you are, the better for us. But I just mean like how much information she fit into this book and like still had new things that she yes. say. yeah. No, she's great. I mean, every chapter in here is like its own mini essay. It's incredible. When you have one of those friends who's like, yeah, I had such a hard time reaching the word count. And then they're like, can you read my essay and like, let me know where I could add more. And you're like, I can't possibly tell you to add more because somehow with like 3000 words to go, you reached every point so perfectly that you should just win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> But yeah, I learned so much. A bunch of you guys have been telling us that you've been getting books that we've talked about. So definitely add this one to your list. You learn so much in under 140 pages. So if you need help figuring out what indie bookstore to buy the book from, or you have any thoughts, concerns, you're going to be purchasing the book and want to talk about it. We are very much online and you can come chat with us at Name Three Songs on Instagram or Twitter. And if If you want even more access, you can join us on Patreon, which is patreon.com slash name three songs. And if you have any personal beef or affection that you want to 100% reach one of us specifically, I am at Sarah underscore Fagan and I'm always accepting love notes and Jenna is at Jenna underscore million and she prefers flowers. (laughs) So we hope that you enjoyed this episode. We hope you learned something new and thank you so much for joining us on name three songs. Until next time. Never let anyone make you feel bad about your favorite band. And remember, you're never too cool to listen to Harry Styles. Don't forget to subscribe to be notified when each episode comes out and leave us a five-star review. We really help. If you want to find out more about the book we discussed today, you can visit namethroughsongs.com.